It's the last book in the Old Testament. Some of us have not spent a lot of time studying the Old Testament. Is that true? There may be some things that we have uh, missed out on because we haven't looked at the Old Testament. So, uh, and, and we're going to look at that passage of Scripture today, which is a, a text that's going to be right before a time of silence. 400 years of silence, actually. And I'm wondering, as we come to this text this morning, have you ever felt in despair? Have, have you ever felt just like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I see a way out. Uh, some of you have ever felt that this, uh, this up here on the mountain? Like, I don't know if I can learn more words. I don't know if I can go through this. I don't know if I can get this math. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's been a few moments. Or in life. I don't know if our family's going to make it. I don't know if this marriage is going to stay together. Or, I don't know how I'm going to handle going through this cancer. Or how I'm going to face it without this person I've loved for all these years. You ever felt that downcast? Israel is at that place. Oh, they've thought they had everything wonderful, but... God is talking to them, and he says, things are not what you think. And we're going to go through a period of despair for Israel, a time of silence. Silence is good at times, isn't it? <laughs> Wasn't it good just a few moments ago just to be quiet and pray? Amen. And so, sometimes we, need, we need, need the silence, but 400 years of it? When you've been used to he hearing from God, hearing prophets speaking on behalf of God, when God was communicating, and 400 years now where there's silence. Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. This is the last, last book in the Old Testament. Last chapter in the Old Testament. Last verses of the Old Testament. Verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total desolation. God, I pray that you will help us to understand that even in a season where we may have no hope, that you are still active, still accomplishing your purposes. And I pray that you would give us all hope today and help us to see the things maybe we need to do to change our place of despair into a time of hope. And help us to see that we're in a world that desperately needs your hope. And may we not be selfish this Christmas with the gifts you have given to us. But may we be a people who shares the hope of Christ with our world, our family, our friends, our neighbors. Yes, Lord, even our enemies. In Jesus' name, amen. Malachi um, has had uh, actually... <clears throat> several chapters here, or, or four chapters here, and, and, and in the Hebrew copy of Malachi, remember in the old, in, in, the, in the scrolls, they didn't actually have chapter headings. So this whole last section here would have been all together. And if it was divided at all, it would not have divided at the beginning of chapter four. But chapter four, in fact, if you look really close at, at the end of what we have is chapter three, and then chapter four, verse one, you'd see that they run right together. They're really one message. And they're talking about the fact that actually Malachi is saying, you know, Israel, uh, I'm about to judge you. And the interesting thing is he actually starts with some of the teachers of the law, the instructors, the pastors, the preachers. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really deal with you first because you've been unholy. He's going to go on and even talk about tithing, their offerings. He says, you know, tithing is something we're supposed to do. We're supposed to give a tenth of what we give. By the way, did you know that we, this last year we... 
Over $845 billion was spent at Christmas. That's a little bit of money. Over $845 billion. Let's see, a tenth of that would have been $8.45 billion. Uh, no, we didn't give that much last year as a church in the world, did we? Hmm. Interesting. Malachi 3 says, uh, you're, you're robbing God. How are you robbing God, Malachi said? You're robbing God by your tithes and your offerings. And he's going to look at these various things, and he's going to come to the end here. And, and, and you need to know this. This is interesting that happens here with Malachi. That the, the scribes, when they were writing down and recording Ma the letter, the book of Malachi, you know what they did with the very last verse? They took the last verse and they added verse 5 one more time. So, so look at this. In fact, this time I'm going to read from the, the New Living Translation. No, I'm going to do the New American Standard this time. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Behold, I'm coming to send, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Did you see what the scribes did there? Why do they took, take verse 5 and repeat it again after verse 6? Because they did not want Malachi to end with a curse. They didn't like the idea that right before God got silent, he, he gave a curse. It's pretty serious words, isn't it? <clears throat> In fact, um, Steve Felker says, um, following this prophecy by Malachi, Israel is going to move into a period in which heaven goes off the air. God will not be broadcasting. No word was heard from him until the silence was broken by the messenger who would introduce the Messiah. The silence of 400 years was broken. Though the Old Testament ends with a curse, the New Testament ushers in salvation, blessing, and hope through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. John Phillips talks about this same curse as the last word of Old Testament. He says, thus the Old Testament ends. The first book in the Bible ends with a coffin. Isaiah ends on a note of judgment. So do Ecclesiastes and Lamentations. Finally, Malachi ends with the word curse. The rabbis sought to avoid the full force of that dread word by repeating verse 5 after verse 6. But God did not want the word muted. He wanted it to wail out its woe down through the silent centuries. God wanted the Jew to find the word curse at the end of his Bible. And what better preparation could there be for a new beginning in Christ? What better preparation could there be for the coming of Jesus who would bring blessing? A curse or Christ? That choice was God's final message to the Old Testament Jew. As you look at this text, he begins verse 4 with, remember the law of Moses, my servant. I don't think it's a coincidence that, that Malachi is going to refer to two very key figures as he ends his letter here, his, ends his prophecy. He's going to refer to Moses, and he's going to refer to Elijah. Aren't these the same two men who will meet him on the mountain of transfiguration? When Jesus is getting up there, and, and what's God doing? God's preparing Jesus, his son, for his death on the cross. And so just days ahead of that, in order to help him, in order to help encourage him, in order to help strengthen him, in order to help him go through this really, really tough, hard, painful time, he sends two guests, two visitors, Moses and Elijah. Who are the two? Incidentally, both are, are prophets, aren't they? Look at uh, Matthew 12, 28. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. No, oh, excuse me, I'm jumping ahead, so let me back up. There were two things that, G, that the law taught, right? Remember? 
First thing that the law taught was love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And the second thing that the law, the law taught was that we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, Mark 12, this is this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the Shema Israel, the blessing of Israel. The Lord our God is one God. And then the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is a teacher of the law saying this. This is a man who wanted you to be dot and tittle, exact and precise on following every command of the law. And he says, you got it, Jesus. <laughs> Interesting, praising Jesus. You got it, Jesus. You got it right. Love God, love your neighbor. It's all right there. And that's more important than any sacrifice, than any offering, than anything else that you do. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to them, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. The last word here in the Old Testament, the last word of Malachi is a word of cursing. <clears throat> if you look at uh, throughout Malachi, you'll see in chapter one says you're offering blemish sacrifices that you would not give to someone important. If you had somebody come over to your house, would you give them bad meat? No. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> Did, did, did any of you give a, serve a Thanksgiving meal and say, okay, oh, let's give the bad stuff to the guests today, right? Let's give the turkey that's going to make them sick. Oh, that'd be wonderful. No, you don't. And he says, why are you offering sacrifices to God that are blemished? They were offering um, blind animals, sick animals, uh, and uh, damaged animals as sacrifices to God. He said, you wouldn't do this for the king. Why would you do it for God? Chapter 2, the priests are supposed to be teaching, and they're supposed to be teaching truth, and instead they're, they're unfaithful. They're not serving God like they're supposed to, and they, and they also have not honored their own marriage vows, and God's going to judge them because of them. And then chapter 3, I already mentioned this, you're, you're robbing God with your tithes, and, and then we come to chapter 4. And if you look at the first part of chapter 4, it says, Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. He's just been referring more than once to the day of the Lord in Malachi, he says, it's coming, it will burn like a furnace, all the arrogant and evil doers will be stubble, and that day is coming, will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them, but for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. There's a day coming when I'm going to act, and it's going to be a good day. I'm actually going to send my Savior. <coughs> Excuse me. But he says, watch out. And actually watch, keep a lookout for the prophet Elijah. I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the day of the Lord comes. And, and I think there's a double message being given here, isn't there? Elijah is going to appear to Jesus the Messiah as he does on the Mount Transfiguration. And Elijah is also going to come again before Christ returns for the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's a phrase that's multiple times found throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. It's about the judgment of God that's going to come. It's going to be a final day of judgment. Evil will all be destroyed. All evil. And as we prepare for that day, the Lord is supposed to get ready for Christ's return. In fact, <clears throat> Matthew 11, Jesus confirms the coming of Elijah. Listen to this, that Matthew 11, verse 9. Then what did you go out to see, a prophet? Yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. 
Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen among anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subject, subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Jesus is actually saying, let me tell you who Elijah was. Malachi says, Elijah coming again, is coming. He's going to come back. He's going to present himself. He's going to reveal himself to the people. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, Elijah came. How did you, Elijah come? Elijah came through John the Baptist. And the writer said, the Bible says, Jesus is saying that the Jews had received it. If the Jews had received him, they would also have understood that John fulfilled the Old Testament prediction of the coming of Elijah before the day of the Lord. What happened at the Mount of Transfiguration? Another, another affirmation, Matthew 17, verse 10. The disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Jesus is saying, Elijah came and he's going to come. Do you see it? He came in John the Baptist, and that was to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. That's foretold right there in Malachi, the, that, the, that the prophet will come, Elijah speaks, and what's the prophet supposed to do? Elijah's supposed to get them ready, prepare the way for the Lord, call them to repentance. What is Jesus saying? That's exactly what happened through John the Baptist. He called the people to repentance. He got them ready. Oh, and he's going to come as well. So notice, Jesus is actually explaining for the theologians who keep questioning this. So when did Elijah come? And was Elijah here already? Is Elijah going to come? And Jesus says, it's both. He was here back then. He was here with John the Baptist. And he's going to be here at the end of time before the great and terrible day of the Lord. In fact, here's what it says in Revelation. Verse, chapter 11, verse 1. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on this holy city for 42 months. That's three and a half years. That's half of seven years. That's the tribulation. And... They've been trampled on for 42 months. And he says, they will tr and I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. By the way, how long is 1,260 days? Three and a half years. 42 months. Oh, my. Hmm. They will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. And they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. That means three and a half years, no rain. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they have finished their testimony... The beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them, overpower, and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. That means Jerusalem. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse their, them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud 
while their enemies looked on. And that's what's going to happen in the last days, on the day, before the day of the Lord. What's Elijah going to do? He's going to do something that he did with John the Baptist. He's going to do it again. He will prepare the people for the Lord. In fact, that was Elijah, that was, excuse me, John the Baptist's responsibility. Elijah speaking in, in, or as, with the spirit of Elijah, like one as Elijah, John the Baptist is coming. He's supposed to get the people ready for the coming of the Lord. He's supposed to get us ready for Christmas. That's what Elijah is coming to do. And look at what Malachi says. Well, actually, let's go, let's go right into Luke 1, verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. What am I talking about? It's Zechariah. Zechariah has had the privilege. He got the lot cast, and he's the one selected to go in and burn incense on the altar. He's going into the holy place, and he's going to burn incense on there. And by the way, he, there's a certain amount of time he's supposed to be in there and, there, and he stays in there for a much longer time. Why? Because the angel of the Lord comes and visits with him. And the people outside are thinking, oh, great, he's died. Because that can happen. If you've sinned, if you're not perfect when you go into the, if you haven't purified yourself properly, you go into that holy place and you're dead. Well, he's in there for a very long time. And what he's doing is he's talking to the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was startled. There's not supposed to be anybody else in here. <laughs> he's startled. And he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. And what's going to happen, by the way, when Mary shows up? He's going to jump inside of Elizabeth's womb, and Elizabeth is going to say, Oh my, the baby within me recognizes the Messiah is here. The mother of the Messiah is here because the Holy Spirit's filling him up even while he's in her womb. He will bring back many, key, key verse here, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Let's go back to Malachi. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. What does it say next? He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. <clears throat> Richard Taylor said, Malachi's Israel was full of men committing acts of treachery and injustice against one another. But Elijah's Israel would be full of righteousness and peace, and his day would be one of revelation, repentance, and reconciliation. How many of you know the name Brett Favre? Oh, a few of you. Are there some Wisconsinians here? No, no. Well, so Brett Favre actually worked, uh, worked for more than one NFL team. And I have a quote here from him. It comes out in, on December 18th, 2009. It was in USA Today. It was at a time when he was still playing at 40 years old, playing for the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, already won uh, several MVP awards, won a Super Bowl. Um, and his wife says this, Deanna. Not only was Brett trying to impress his coach, she's answering as to why is Brett still playing at 40 years old? After all these laurels and everything, why was he still praying, playing? Not only was Brett trying to impress his coach, he was trying to make his dad proud. 
That mentality always stuck with him. Six years after his father died, Brett Favre is still struggling to his most vocal second guesser. I knew he was proud of me, but he was one of those who never said it. In addition, he says, Favre goes on, never did he say he loved us. But we knew, and vice versa, we never said it to him. Favre says, I'm going to make sure my children never have to assume I love them, and I'm proud of them. I'm going to tell them every chance I get. Part of being a father is to give them a place in the world where love, welcome, and acceptance rules. While I'm at it, I think I might call my dad too. How are you going to prepare for Christmas this year? What are you going to do to get ready? And the question maybe you need to think about is, do you need to turn your heart? Do you personally need to turn your heart? There were parents in the days of Malachi who were actually sacrificing their children to Moloch. Killing them simply to give them over to a, a god, an idol, who did not have any power. But is that so different than today? As we sacrifice our children to the god of choice, and we abort millions each year, or we sacrifice our children to the god of success, or the one that's really ruling our day, the God of selfishness. Is we want to do what's important for me to be happy. And sadly, some of you have experienced and been a part of that kind of a sacrifice. But notice what he says. He's going to turn the hearts of the parents to the children. When Elijah comes back, he's going to call us to repentance. It's what he did in the day of Jesus. And until then, we ought to be repenting ourselves even now of our relationships with our family, with our parents, and with our children. Because doesn't he go on to the next phrase? By the way, is anybody, does anybody here have a parent? <laughs> I'm thinking we all do. <laughs> even if we never knew them, if, even if we, we were born and, and, and orphaned from the start and were never adopted, guess what? We still have a parent, don't we? Every single one of us. Well, what does it say? Elijah is going to not only turn the hearts of the parents to the children, but the hearts of the parents, the children, to the parents. And I just want you to think a little bit about this. Do any of you blame your parents for things that have happened in your life? Do any of you hold your parents responsible for some of their behaviors? Do any of you judge them on a higher standard than you judge yourself? Do any of you remember uh, what they've done wrong and maybe forget what you've done? Do any of you carry pain and bitterness because of things that parents did to you? Or maybe step-parents or, or somebody else living at home, and the list can go on and on. And it says that Elijah, when he comes, is going to call the children, the parents, to come back to the children, but the children to come back to the parents. Uh, don't forget this, that there's a, in the Ten Commandments, those that Jesus summarized with love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do you remember there's a commandment in there that says, and honor your mother and father, and there's a promise that goes with it that it may go well with you. It's only one of the Ten Commandments that has a promise that goes well, goes with it. And maybe one of the things that we all have to do is look and say, are we honoring our mothers and our fathers? And you know, that's kind of hard if mom and dad were imperfect. N no, it's even harder if mom and dad were really messed up. Most of us were born to parents who were not, who, who were not much older than you kids here. Parents who had children at 16, at 15, at sometimes it's 13, at 18, at 20, at 21, at 25. Of course, there's some of you that had extraordinary parents. You were born to them when they were 44. 
but most of us were born to young people who are just, we're just as challenged with life as we are, who have just as many struggles as we have, who wonder about whether they really have any value or worth, who had no training as how to be a parent except the parent before them, who didn't say, I love you, like Favre said, who didn't, and, and, and they didn't say it back, who grew up in a culture, didn't communicate, didn't open up their hearts. Maybe you were orphaned, maybe you were adopted out. I mean, all kinds of things and all, and yet, and yet, we are being held back. And as you prepare for Christmas, think about this. This is one of those family times of the year, isn't it? Christmas is one of those heart-wrenching times of the year. Not only is it a fun time, a joy-filled time, a time when family gets together, but it's also a painful time of the year when somebody's hoping to hear from somebody else and they don't. A mother's hoping that a son will call. A father who won't call, but he's waiting for, for his daughter to call him. It's just it's some of their own cultural background all, and there is a need for the families to come back together. And I think what, what, what Malachi would want us to understand is that the responsibility is not the other person's. I have responsibility. And so he says that he's going to turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to the parents. What do you need to do as you get ready for Christmas? Uh, you know, there's some things that you could do, by the way, this Christmas that might make it even more special. You can give some unique gifts, couldn't you? Uh, there's all kinds of ways that you can do gifting this year, and I would just encourage you, think about doing something different. Maybe you need to support some missionary and, and find that missionary and, and, then t and then write a letter to the person you're giving and giving and saying, I just want you to know that I have committed in your name to supporting this missionary who does this kind of work. Perhaps you want to buy a, a, a lamb for, or chickens for a family in Haiti that's going to provide food for them. You can do that through World Vision. And in fact, there, we'll, we'll have different options like that that you can give a gift. Think about that. I remember the one year that I gave Debbie a sewing machine. Yeah, a sewing machine. It was really cool. It was one of these little toy ones, about this big, right? And, and that was her Christmas present. And I gave it to her, but it was really a symbol of the sewing machine that we sent to people in, in, in Asia. Who, this lady was getting a sewing machine that she was going to be able to start her own business and thereby take care of her own family. And, and that gift that that I gave Debbie that year, that gift is still being a blessing to that lady over there who, who's, who had needs that are way beyond what Debbie and I have as our, our wants. And, and so why don't you think about doing something like that? As you're getting ready for Christmas, what could you do to show love to the people that are, that are around you? And may I ask you this, are you willing to repent before Christmas? <clears throat> to repent. There is not a single person in this room who doesn't need to repent, who doesn't have stuff that's getting in the way of your relationship with God, who's harming your relationship with others. Let's face it, there's things you hold against somebody else. There's times you've been wronged and, and God's saying, will you repent and no longer hold it against them? Will you somehow forgive them? Will you at least let me forgive them through you? Will you let me work in your life? There's stuff that you've put ahead of me and, and it could be all kinds of things and people even. Will you repent of that and put me first? Will you love me more than anything else? Jesus is going to come again. He is. For some of us, he's going to come a lot sooner than the rest of you. Okay? Our age means we're going to beat you there. <laughs> and, and, and Jesus is going to come again for, for, for us. But the fact is, is that Jesus is coming again to the world. When Elijah, and, and, and we believe that, at least I believe it's probably going to be Moses and Elijah that show up that day. Two prophets, incidentally. Some say it's going to be Enoch and Elijah because both of them never died, right? They were just both taken up into heaven. But, but I think it's going to probably be Moses and Elijah that are going to show up that day. They were the ones who showed up with Jesus and, and, and helped encourage him as he got ready to go to the cross, and they're going to come back one more time. Folks, don't wait for Elijah and Moses to show up. Don't wait for the witnesses to come and bring judgment to the world before Jesus returns. Repent today. You say, well, what do I need to repent of, Bill? I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, you probably are. 
But you know there's stuff in you that's not honoring God. You know you're carrying garbage. You know there's, there's times that you just blatantly, if you really were honest about it, blatantly disobey what God says. I'll give you a simple one. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. What do you mean? I break that one? Oh yeah? Do you ever think unkindly of your neighbor? Hmm. Do you ever not like somebody around you? Do you ever think bad thoughts about them? I, I'm sure you wouldn't curse them. But do you ever get ticked at somebody else? Do you ever get ticked at somebody you love? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. What do you need to repent of? What do you need to say, okay, God, this is really just, this is not honoring you. It's not blessing you. Would you pray about that as you get ready for Christmas? Maybe that matters to Jesus more than any gift you can give to anyone else. Pray about what's in your heart. And the tough thing is, some of us are still blaming mom and dad. Some of us are still looking at them and they were just as imperfect as you are. And some of us need to do some forgiving and some blessing and some letting go and saying, I love you. And we need to let God turn our hearts back to mom and dad. And maybe we also need to let God turn our hearts back to the people around us, the neighbors, the friends, the people who don't have hope. Because we have a world that's getting meaner and meaner, grumpier, grouchier, more hostile. And isn't it just really easy to love somebody who's grumpy? <laughs> and we need to allow God to turn our hearts to love the people around us. Are you willing to repent as you get ready for Christmas? Let's pray. Oh, Lord, there's so many times I feel so inadequate at trying to get your message out. But I thank you that conviction's not my responsibility. It's the responsibility of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, that I don't have to know <laughs> the details of any person's life here to be able to say to them, Repent. I thank you that that's a message that's true. It's from your spirit, and it's for all of us. And that it's not a message meant to bring judgment, doom and gloom, despair and depression on us, but instead meant to bring us to joy and freedom, to forgiveness and to love, to experience all of what you want to give to us, that we're being held back because we don't repent. So, Lord, I pray for an incredible Christmas right now, not one without hope, but one with hope because Jesus Christ died to set us free from sin and to give us new life. So, Jesus, show us where we need to repent, where we need to change, where we need to change our minds, change the direction of our thoughts, our focus, change our behavior, where we've got to turn a totally 180 and refocus on you. Show us where we need to repent. And I thank you, God, that when we, you show that to us, we don't have to do it alone, but that you help us. <laughs> Maybe that's why you sent Moses and Elijah. It's why you sent Elijah through, through John the Baptist to call the people to repentance before you even came, Jesus. Before you started your ministry, he was out there preparing the people, calling them to repentance. May that same thing happen in us today as we get ready for Christmas. Call us to repentance. For that is the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord God, right now, if there's anyone here who hasn't who hasn't taken that step to say, okay, yes, I, I want to follow you, Jesus. I haven't always understood it, but, and I maybe don't even totally understand it now, but Jesus, you died on a cross because you love me. I'm far from perfect, and I need, to, I need you and your forgiveness, and I accept it right now. 
And I would just ask you to right now say yes to Jesus. Right there in your heart and soul, say yes to Jesus. And if you do that today, please tell someone. We finish this prayer, when we finish the final song, tell someone else here or tell a family member back home or tell a friend, but tell someone today, I said yes to Jesus Christ. Oh God, I do pray that you would turn the hearts of the parents to their children. Help us, each one of us that are parents, to show love to our children even if they're 65 years old. Help us to show love to them, Jesus. But then also, Lord, turn the hearts of the children to the parents. Because we're in a, we're in a throwaway society that, that we ignore even the most important relationships. May that not be the case this Christmas, Lord. So turn the hearts of the children, each of us, to our parents. And Lord, I pray especially for that person or persons who don't know their parents, never met them, don't even know their name. But it's because of them that they live and you've given them life. And Lord, maybe they grieve over that. Maybe they hurt. Maybe they've reached a point where they just don't care. But they need their heart turned to their parent because that parent, even be, be maybe by actions that were sinful, gave life. And may they accept that life as a gift from you. So turn our hearts to our parents and call us to repentance in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The song says, Oh, come to the altar. Oh, come to the altar. God wants us to come to the altar, his altar, to repent, to let him change us, to become like him, to have his heart and his love. Don't be afraid of repentance.